green team. That's what Ethan and I have decided for right now. We're calling our listeners. Uh, if you have input on a better name, that's the best that we came up with so far. So let us know. We'll give you all of our contact information at the end here. I am coming to you from central Illinois. Ethan... How's it going? I'm coming in from the St. Louis area. We're doing this episode remote from each other. We're unable to be in the same area right now, given the busy season that we are currently in. It is spring and we are both working and uh, staying quite busy. So uh, driving three hours to meet each other uh, is kind of off the table right now. So bear with us for a slightly different audio experience. Yeah, we're in the horticulture industry, at least in the Midwest. Typically, that busy season runs from, uh, what, mid-April to mid-June is kind of our peak. A little bit different down by you because you're about a month ahead of us temperature-wise. Yeah, yeah. I'd say on on average, I would say in a garden center setting, at least at least 40% of the total sales happen between April and May. And I would say probably at least 50% of the total sales happen between April and June. And speaking of spring temperatures and spring planting, you've been on the news, what, twice in the last week getting interviewed about horticulture working at Greenscape? So, yeah, the local news, uh, Fox News came in, uh, I think it's Fox 2, and they came in on April 22nd and came into Greenscape Gardens and they needed someone to do a quick little TV spot warning about the frost date that we had going on for a couple of days down here. Also, speaking of which, MissouriBotanical.org has... For the St. Louis area, the first on average frost date being October 15th and the last on average frost date being April 15th. April 15th. Okay, so really it's like a whole month, almost exactly a month different than central Illinois, which is essentially what I've been saying before. As far as it feels like we're a month ahead of where you're at. Hmm. Interesting. It's just, um, it's amazing how three hours south can have such a dramatic climate change. Oh, huge. Yeah. And so I just went on and educated people very quickly, briefly as to what they can do to protect their plants prior to the frost that was happening. Since we've all, uh, at least down here in the St. Louis area, many of us have already started our gardening. And like myself, by that time, I had already potted up my annual patio containers I've already I haven't planted. I still haven't planted any of my vegetables or herbs, but I certainly had bought them and uh, you know had them in my garage. Sure. But anyway, so I just instructed people to make sure that they thoroughly watered the ground of any plants that they may have already installed, whether it be in the ground or things that they had recently planted or anything that was starting to bud out, whether it was new foliar growth or something that was a little bit more tender, like an azalea that would have been in potentially uh, blooming at that time, or if you had a hydrangea that was setting off buds, anything like that, just how to protect your plant. And the methods that I recommended were to make sure that you watered the ground, not to overhead water. You don't want a whole bunch uh, the evening prior to the frost to go ahead and saturate the foliage of your plants, but to make sure that the ground was thoroughly watered. And the reasoning behind that is that as the, you are watering your roots, uh, that water is going to take up any air pockets that are in the soil. Any available air pockets for a drier soil, well, that cold air is easier to get in there and to damage the roots. So if you thoroughly water, uh, that's just in a way insulating the plant. And then to go ahead and to drape a sheet or something light, whether it was frost cloth or landscape fabric, I put dirty laundry over my clothes when I got home. Um, After that, I just dirty laundry over your clothes. Uh, Yeah, I just grabbed some dirty laundry out of my hamper and uh, and I literally just draped those over my cactus, which I had already pulled out and had outside. So they just had I I completely put my greenscape shirt that I was wearing that evening over my rubber tree. 
and it just looked like a lumpy <laughs> fat guy inside of that shirt. <laughs> so uh, it was interesting to to see that. And I was like, is that what I look like in this shirt? <laughs> like, <oof. laughs> but, but so anyway, so yeah, I, I literally just draped some dirty clothes over my uh, tender plants that I had outside that I was not interested in bringing inside. And uh, yeah, so that was the first one. And then today, and today, you know, you will probably hear this episode later than today, but today is April 28th. And Fox News came out again and just wanted to have someone do a TV spot on the spring kickoff. And I just kind of gave a little bit of a chat about what people are buying and to be prepared to if you shop at a garden center in May to the fact that it's going to be very busy and that you might need to wait to be serviced by someone who is educated enough to talk to you about plants. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a, a tiny bit different down there because you guys are a little ahead warm weather wise. But up here, the weekend of Mother's Day was always the busiest weekend of the whole entire year for plant sales. It's a non-negotiable as far as working in this industry. You work Mother's Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like one of those things where like, hey, if you're not going to work Mother's Day weekend, you shouldn't be working in this industry, which is kind of a bummer. You know, it's like something to consider for our little um, our our little violin on our soapbox here. Just be aware that as you are enjoying your shopping experience at a garden center, all of those people are unable to be with their mothers while you are shopping with your mother. <laughs> so just take that into consideration as you get to enjoy buying that six pack of petunias that I am unable to enjoy that experience with my mother. <laughs> So can you play Maybe we can intro or have that with some really sad, music, <laughs> some uh, slow, sad that. violin. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, put that really in. very melancholy. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, just a couple nights ago, my mom texted me, too, and she's like, hey, are you going to be you going to be around that day? Or are you going to be busy working? <laughs> because I've been in this industry so long that she knows every year that it's very hit or miss on on uh, how close to Mother's Day I can come up and visit. People in this industry don't get to hang out with their moms on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to give a little snippet about Greenscape there that we've referenced a few times? Yeah, so Greenscape Gardens is um, in the De Pair, Baldwin, Manchester, depending on what Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever map services you have. <laughs> it could be in Baldwin or... Uh, I think technically it is in Baldwin, Missouri, and a small mom and pop garden center that offers everything from annuals and vegetables and herbs all the way to trees and shrubs. They have a great native department, perennial departments, bag goods. So it's kind of covering all the bases of a retail establishment, but not offering or dabbling in the commercial side of things as far as no bulk material, uh, no retaining wall material, stepping stones. It's pretty much pretty, uh, pretty say, plant almost focused. strictly. Yeah, exactly. Very plant focused. I got to talk to Jen, the manager there, while I visited you last. And yeah, it was great to get to talk to her and, and just see the crazy variety of, I mean, you walked me through trees and shrubs and just all that stuff, all the funky varieties of things that uh, we didn't even necessarily get up here that much, which of course there are some extra things down in there because you're what, zone six, zone seven, and that new fruit and veggie garden area that they're having installed as as a, a show garden. Super nice Is it completed now? Oh, it is. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'll, completely it, completed. They just haven't redone it to the point where it's full of vegetables and herbs yet, but oh, it'll get there. Sure. But yeah, that was gorgeous. Yeah, just a just a really great spot to pop into and shop, definitely. And speaking of really cool garden centers to visit, I was in just about a week ago. I visited Hornbaker Gardens in Princeton, Illinois, and in the Illinois Valley area, they're very well known as being a destination spot. I mean, they're, they it's have a tourist attraction for sure. Yeah. They have a whole venue there that they do weddings and events at that's super nice, uh, at least from the outside. I haven't been on the inside, but if the rest of their grounds is any indicator, I'm sure it's gorgeous because they have essentially extremely nicely designed trial gardens, landscape beds all around their property with 
whether it be some of the funky tree varieties that they carry. They grow out a lot of their own hostas, so they have a ton of hosta gardens. Just everywhere, pretty much everywhere on that property that would make a great spot for your wedding photos, your prom photos, engagement, you name it, on top of being, you know, a world-class garden center. All the And what was the name? Hornbakers. Yes. Right, I just wanted to... Yeah, Hornbaker Gardens in Princeton, Illinois. And so we were out to pick up a contorted locust tree. And they had a couple... Super cool, by the way. Underutilized, gorgeous tree. Yes. Very fragrant white flowers that bloom later in the season. Yeah, very, very funky. The contorted branches just make, they kind of add to that already kind of open airy look of a of a more traditional locust tree. And I think stay... And we actually have one at Greenscape that's like full grown. It's oh, a okay. gorgeous, beautiful tree on the premises. Yeah, it's stunning. People ask all the time when it's flowering what it is. Is it uh, 15 feet tall like the uh, plant tags all say the maximum height is? <laughs> It is absolutely larger than 15 feet tall and wide, but it's also been there for decades. Yeah. And, that, and that's a whole other episode that we can talk about the uh, the falsities of plant tags versus the realities of the plants. And what I'm constantly reminding people of is plants don't give a crap what's written about them. And I think in this particular case with that tree, I'm guessing that those growers are putting a 10 year size. They had one on the ground right. that was planted, I think he said seven, seven or 10 years ago. And yeah, it was definitely around that 15 feet or so. But the other the one, one we have, have is probably about 20 by 20 right now, if not a little bit bigger. Yeah, they, they had another that was planted 30, 35 years ago, a, a little closer to some other trees. So it was definitely reaching to get, you know, competing for sunlight. And it was a good 30 feet for sure. But so we were out to pick up one of those guys, talk to one of the owners, super nice guy, very knowledgeable. He answered all the questions I had about that tree. And then when he mentioned that they had the little bit younger one planted in a better spot up by their venue building, we decided to take a walk up there, take a look at it in person and then come back down gorgeous tree in person and as we were walking back towards the retail area um, I was out there with my mom she goes hey let's pop into they have a couple kind of Morton building like finished Morton buildings there with with a couple retail spaces with some retail product and we walk into the building there there weren't any employees in the building because their main checkout is in the building across the roadway there and walk in and there's kind of a haze in the whole room and she goes are they burning incense in here and immediately i was like that that smells like wood smoke you know something something's off and so we we both start looking around the room and she goes over to one of the corners and sure enough in the corner where there's kind of like a six by six post the main corner support there, there is smoke pouring out from behind the post at the ground level. And so we run outside. This is in like the like the inside, like the garden center, like the inside garden retail area. Yes. One of the one of their retail areas. They're they're both they have two two kind of shoppable retail areas across a little kind of one lane road there. One has their registers and some smaller pottery and that kind of thing. And this one had like wind chimes and hummingbird feeders gotcha. and outdoor mats and that kind of stuff. And so we run outside of the building and run around to the corner. And at some point, I think we had yelled to one of the employees that there was smoke in the building. And so they were getting on radios and that kind of thing. And we go around the corner and right at that corner behind that wall where the smoke was coming out, there was a couple feet off the ground, a an electrical conduit box with three big lines going into it. So somewhere under the ground in that corner, an electrical fire had started and it was spreading in the walls of the building from that corner. And so it was quite a scramble. You know, they were trying to find fire extinguishers and and uh, getting employees there to try to move some of the product out of the building. And everybody was kind of scrambling. And at some point I said to the owner guy we were talking to, I go, I go, do you do you want me to get in touch with the fire department and get them? Because 
pretty quickly it's like we're not going to be able to do anything to stop a fire spreading inside the walls like the, none of us are are the right people for this task and so they ended up sending out two fire engines a tanker truck and a you know fire chief suv and they had to break into the walls with axes and demo saws from the inside to be able to spray into the walls to put out this fire that was spreading so kind of a a unexpected crazy day they had shut off the power that was one of the things to like hey where's the main power for the property that because who knows what this line was going to we did end up buying the tree they had to write out all the information on paper because all the power was out they should have given you the damn tree <laughs> i think they had other things that they were more concerned about at the time uh like you the, didn't you the didn't press them part. for a discount <laughs> after saving their establishment from burning to the ground uh, during their busy season <laughs> But uh, only you can prevent home bigger fires. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of our little unexpected adventure at Hornbaker. And uh, we went out to dinner for my mom's birthday right after that and kind of regaled the story to everybody. <laughs> that Hornbaker's paid for. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Uh, you're right i should have i should have milked this more and you saved their multi-million dollar establishment during the time of year that they rake in multi-million dollars uh, they charged you full price for that three uh, <laughs> little, little did they know that we have a podcast <laughs> Hornbakers, I do like you. You are a great establishment, yeah, but I, you should totally reach out to Nick and, and buy his mom dinner at least. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had caught the name of the of the gentleman that we had talked to. I, from what I gathered, I think maybe his parents are the current owners and then he's going to be taking it over. He looked to be maybe like, you know, late 30s, early 40s or so. Super, super nice guy. Very friendly. So knowledgeable. Uh, when we were talking to him, I'm like, he he's either been in horticulture a long time or owns the business and... He was owner of the business. So, okay. yeah, that was, you've been on the news twice. I helped to stop a fire. Interesting week. Busy week on top of our spring busy season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, between uh, working at uh, Greenscape Gardens and starting a large landscape job um, that I have with a commercial customer. Yeah, and congrats on that new project. That, this is going to be a very busy next couple of month and a half, so... Good thing we're not doing video because our listeners don't need to see how purple the unders of my eyes are. <laughs> or mine. <laughs> <Right>. And <laughs> Green with... thumbs and purple sacks <laughs> under your eyes. <laughs> Green thumbs and purple sacks. Well, now that wouldn't be a good... That, that just sounds terrible. <laughs> Does that need to be on a t-shirt? Green thumbs and purple eyes. <laughs> Green thumbs and dark circles. There we go. There you go. We'll get to it eventually. Uh, <laughs> and and on that note, again, so uh, the next few recordings here until we get through the spring season, we'll probably have a mix of episodes coming to you with myself producing from Illinois and Ethan from St. Louis. Hopefully in there we'll get some in-person visits in. But yeah, well, until then, we'll have some boat recordings for you guys and with that we're going to get into this week's topic which is something that is bees yes bees and misconceptions about bees i think more importantly because i think a lot of times bees get kind of lumped in as this category of insects that people can sometimes have a, a fear of and Often unnecessarily, you know, if you have a, a known allergy, that's one thing. But I think a lot of times bees get a bad rap lumped in with wasps that can be more aggressive. And, hornets. Or hornets. And there are a lot of things that look like bees or act like bees or have colors similar to bees and wasps that are actually other beneficial pollinators, other flies and things like that, that have adopted those color patterns for evolutionary advantage, um, but are, you know, no need to have a fear of those. So we thought it was important, especially with a lot of 
decline that we're seeing in bee populations, largely from overuse of pesticides and human involvement. So we wanted to cover this because it's so, you know, bees and other pollinators are so critical to our food supply that we want people to be aware of those issues, know what to be looking for as far as bees and wasps, and, you know, have a little more, maybe not need to be quite as afraid of some of those guys, of course, again, unless you have a severe allergy, something like that. Absolutely. Totally understand. If you have a severe allergy, totally get that, you know, if you're the type of person that has an EpiPen on you during the spring and summer months, totally get it. But as far as just being afraid of bees, we we definitely want to touch on that because I have I can tell you from being in the middle of swarms that are happening and a transition from one hive to another to literally holding bees in my hand to touching them to petting them to uh, they they really don't care about you. (laughs) You know, they have a job and you're not it. Right. And yeah, same for myself. I've been uh, one of my most probably fun experiences with being around a lot of bees at one point was we were up visiting Michigan State University for their, I believe it's the growers tour that they put on every year, which is kind of a collaboration between Michigan State University, which has a huge horticulture program and a few other big commercial growers up there in the kind of central to southwest Michigan area. It's technically called the Michigan Garden Plant Tour. That is open to both people in the industry as well as the general public. I believe there are some guided tours at Michigan State every year, or you can just go and do a self-guided. Their grounds are gorgeous. And then that is in collaboration with Four Star Greenhouse, Mast Young Plants, Michigan State University Trial Garden, Pell Greenhouses, Raker Roberta's Young Plants, and Walter's Gardens. And a lot of those are either perennial or annual, maybe a little bit of woody plant material, commercial producers in Michigan. So that is definitely an event worth checking out. They do that every summer. But at Michigan State, in one of their gardens, I think it's even in the Children's Garden, they have a bee hotel and we will link a picture of that Um, but it's essentially this small covered structure that you can just attach to a fence area with lots of blocks of untreated wood with holes drilled in it tubes from reeds or bamboo all sorts of things like that i know mason mason bees would love that yes that's like right up their alley mason bees love to inhabit uh already pre-made structures as opposed to building their own in fact i'm not even 100 but i'm pretty sure they almost always find a home in an already existing structure the mason bee and yeah this it was fascinating to see because as you're watching Standing face to face with this bee hotel, standing face to face with essentially nests of dozens of varieties of beneficial pollinator bees, and they're just going about their business, flying around you. You can watch like the little leaf cutter bees. They're bringing in pieces of leaves and plant material and plugging up those little holes and building their segments of nest inside these tubes absolutely fascinating to watch and hundreds of bees are flying around you and they could not care less that you're there they are busy building their nests and feeding their little colonies or some of them i guess are more solitary as well but which we'll get into but uh just going about their business and not at all threatened that you're there or aggressive towards people as with most varieties of of the, the native bees. Oh, I would say, yeah, most bees are really only prone to stinging you unless they feel threatened individually or to protect their hive. You know, there's many, a many of them are too species. close to a hive, whether unintentional or intentional and you get too close and you you specifically you interact with it, you bump it, you move it, you shift it. Of course, there is a potential of uh, of them reacting to defend their territory. 
because uh, they don't know. You could be a bear or something that's trying to break in and, and eat the honey or a large creature that's there to eat the larva or something like that. So, you know, high in protein snack for a lot of creatures, especially on omnivores. So they don't know that. But as far as interacting with bees that are just out and about doing their thing and, and harvesting pollen, yeah, they gosh, they could or care so little plants. about you. Right. And a lot of those native bee varieties are ground nesting or nest in wood and stems. They're not necessarily all a big colony type species like honeybees where they're where they have a big group hive that they want to protect and defend their queen. Mm-hmm. So that's an important thing to note, too. So and generally those hives are not going to be in town with a lot of traffic of people because they want to stay out of the way as well. So, yeah, that kind of that feeling of danger around bees and thinking you're going to get swarmed is is just not quite as prevalent as what, you know, maybe uh, movies would make it look out to be. Or just not even movies, just my gosh, just just the fact that, like you said, they just get lumped in with wasps and hornets. So it's this yellow and black or primarily this yellow and black flying insect just automatically assume that it's going to bite and or sting you, um, which is rather far from the truth. Yeah. And now, you know, some of the wasp and hornet varieties, of course, they can tend to be a little more aggressive for no reason. I know I've had a couple run-ins with with your wasps that tend to be under the eaves of houses or between some fence panels of wooden fences in the yard or built under some pathway lights on the landscape. Or ground hornets or something. God yeah. forbid you stumble across a ground hornet nest. So things like that, that's a little bit different story. Another thing I think too is people think they're going to get stung repeatedly by bees and we were kind of discussing earlier if you want to do you want to give your your description of a honeybee sting well gosh i mean a a honeybee of of all creatures they're one of the bee species that if they sting you they die in horrible fashion it is certainly not in a honeybee's best interest to sting you their stinger is barbed and so once it goes in it can't come out. So once they have stung you and they go to pull away, the stinger stays in you, if not entirely partially, and it pulls out of their body. And as they fly away, their insides just fall out of their body and they die horribly, guts flying around in graphic fashion, at least to in the insect's eyes perspective. Uh, so it is a terrible, horrible death uh, for a honeybee if it stings you. It, and they only get that little, one shot. Form of, yeah, they have one attack. They have one bullet in the chamber, and that is it. And if they, they have to be extremely, they have to be extremely threatened to waste that on you. So, and what a sad event for them to feel like they had to do that simply because uh, it flew close to you and you decided to swat at it unnecessarily, or if it gets um, and it caught feels threatened and therefore like stings that. you. Yeah, getting caught in clothing is another thing, you know, if they feel like they're going to get squished, which feeling like you're going to get squished and then doing a thing that's for sure going to, you know, stinging (laughs) that for sure kills them is, you know, maybe a little uh, of a weird choice from them. But when people start over the swatting at flying insects, especially bees, and they kind of, you know, some people just have this innate need to just like start making rapid movements and to swat and to swing and and then to then have the audacity to get upset that something has stung them when they acted that way. It's like, how would a person feel if a person was close to you and you started erratically flailing your arms and slapping them? You'd be hard pressed to not get some sort of physical reaction out of that person. <laughs> right. um, so it's being calm goes a long way. Right. And again, a lot of those native varieties, they're either more solitary or live in smaller groups or nest in those other in the ground or wood and stems. And so they really have no interest in in what humans are doing. And I do usually recommend for people who are working in gardens, especially if you have a pollinator garden or you have plants that attract pollinators such as bees, 
go out wearing neutral colors. You know, if you're worried about attracting bees to you, certainly don't, you know, blow all the perfume all over you to go out and garden and wear tighter fitting clothes or long sleeve shirts or pants just to kind of eliminate or further reduce the likelihood of you getting a bee trapped around you or confused by your presence. Yeah. A little more of a, a little more of a barrier. And again, even still, if you're not prone to a severe allergic reaction, the chance of that happening, I mean, I've been in the business for better part of a decade, just like you have. And I think the only times that I've been stung working outside 8, 10, 12 hours a day for years in a row. I can think of maybe a handful of times I've gotten stung and those were all from wasps and they were in a weird spot. Like one time I was landscaping, pulling some weeds along a sidewalk and in a rock bed and they had those little pathway lights that are about a foot or so off the ground and a few wasps had started to build a nest under the dome of that pathway light which you know you're never gonna really bump into unless you're out there actively pulling weeds and messing around in that area and I had one fly into my boot and get me a couple times but 10 minutes later if that you know you're fine so it's Uh, it's really I have I've been that's been 10 10 years yeah, and and about the same amount of time I've been stung twice by bees, but that was during a swarm transfer. And this is well after being in the middle of the swarm surrounded by thousands of bees. And then once the swarm departed and the old queen left the hive and her drones followed suit with her, that new swarm was taken and collected and and moved away. The bees that were left that didn't make it in that container were upset and confused. And I got hit a couple of times, but that was a very specific situation. Um, Actively moving a colony of bees. Absolutely. But that's two times in almost 10 years that I can uh, that I know that I've been stung by a bee, Uh, whereas wasps and hornets, uh, definitely a handful of times I actively watched. uh, It's like six or seven years ago, a wasp bite and sting me simultaneously. They were inside of an arborvitae that I was moving, Mm -hmm. um, an evergreen shrub. Mm -hmm. And I moved that arborvitae and inside of that arborvitae was a small wasp nest and they were pretty pissed off at me. And one wasp in particular grabbed a hold of my forearm with its chompers and actively stung me three times while walking up my arm before I uh, flicked it off of me. So, uh, yeah, you know, a very different creature. Still, that wasp was defending its territory. I don't fault it. But, man, that was a begonia of a sting. <laughs> And with the bees and the wasps, uh, respectively, how long would you say it took as far as, you know, the main initial pain of that sting to go away? Ten minutes. Yeah. The wasp sting lasted longer. Um, Wasp stings in general for me have lasted a little bit longer, but are no more of an irritant after the initial uh, shock and impact of the sting. No more of an irritant than... You know, a mosquito bite or for me brushing up against juniper, I'm allergic to juniper. And so whenever I work along a juniper plant, I break out in hives. So it's to me, it's no different than than that. It's really a rather mild. But I'm also someone who doesn't have an allergy to that. True. So being stung uh, between the two of us and almost two decades working pretty heavily outdoors and really in it in the environments that that those critters could be to have less than 10 incidents between the two of us your risk is relatively low if you're not kind of like Keith and said flailing around out there when when things are flying around and potentially making them think you're more of a threat than you actually are several times a week i actively touch a bee yeah you can touch uh, it honeybees, bumblebees, all those guys buzzing around flowers. I think the first time I ever saw somebody pet a bumblebee on a flower, uh, I was out in Colorado in maybe like 2015, which I knew even then that they weren't really something to be concerned about. But I, I saw a friend actively pet a bumblebee on a flower and I was like, oh, this is perfect to be able to show customers at the garden center. to, to Not to dissipate. recommend that you just go out and try to pet a bee. Well, mm-hmm. But but 
Yes. And the same thing. I do the same thing right. with customers to showcase like, hey, you don't need to be afraid and I'll go and I'll kind of touch the bee and and it it's not bothered by my they're, presence. They're doing really their job. Less. They're they're collecting their nectar to go back and feed their little colony and they're working. They couldn't care less. Yeah, you're they have to. a job and you're not part of it. Yeah. So as you can tell, we we do not like bees. <laughs> Probably one thing you've gathered from this podcast is to hell with bees. Um, we would really, we would really rather that when you are actively in your garden and you have a beautiful garden full of Russian sage and salvia and cone flowers and and all these wonderful pollinator friendly uh, plants, just go out there with a weed whacker and just kill as many bees and cut <laughs> off as many flowers as you can. <laughs> Uh, one thing we should probably talk about is insecticides, insecticide use. Yes, yes. So on that note, I will link a few different articles from both Michigan State University and there are quite a few good ones I have pulled up here from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'll just rattle off some titles here. Uh, we have Native Bee Habitat, Habitat Tips and Instructions. That's from Michigan State the Fish and Wildlife Service has quite a few on, this one is titled, Pollinator Populations Across the U.S. Are Declining and Everyone Can Help. And they, they have a few different initiatives going there that you can read about. The threats to pollinators, that's another one that we're going to get into here. Probably the biggest threat to populations of pollinators. And is us. Is us, yeah. And generally linked to the overuse of pesticides. I covered quite a bit of this through my studies at Illinois Wesleyan and environmental studies in that program. A lot of us have been hearing in the last few years in the news, it's even been covered about bee population decline, colony die offs, that kind of thing. And a lot of it is tied back to that pesticide use because a lot of pesticides are kind of generic to many types of arthropods, including bees and other beneficial pollinators. So as we're applying or over applying or potentially preventatively applying some of these pesticides, sometimes indiscriminately to protect other crops, the the side effect of that is also killing off uh, bee and pollinator populations. And that could, you know, that also includes things like the monarch butterfly or your beneficial praying mantids or ladybugs a lot of those guys that especially with some of the systemic insecticides the neonicotinoid neonic pesticides those have been highlighted a bit recently i've seen a few of the box stores start to label product or growers that supply the box stores start to label certain things as not treated with neonics because those are a systemic insecticide that's either sprayed on the plant or watered into the plant, uptaken by the plant's roots, and then it, it essentially makes all parts of that plant that have absorbed that chemical, it translocates to all parts of the plant. And when, say, an aphid or a mite or some other a, a thrip, like a western flower thrip, some kind of crop pest, whether that be for field crops or, or nursery plants, your annuals for your front porch, those pests that they're trying to prevent, it's poisonous to those pests trying to eat that plant. But then when a honeybee or a ladybug or or a monarch butterfly or some other butterfly, uh, you know, things that we think of as a pleasant insects to have in the garden, when those insects then consume the pollen or the nectar of that plant, as is their job going around to try to feed themselves, that chemical is also acutely toxic to them. So they eat that pollen or that nectar and it, it kills them as well. Right. So there are, when you are using a systemic insecticide and a common ingredient that is used in a lot of systemic insecticides, something that you would water your plant with to make it um, more immune to chewing insects. Uh, one of the common ingredients is imidacloprid, and that one is a neonic. And like you were saying, yeah, it, it infects and kills the chewing insects on that plant, but 
if an aphid is chewing that and then it becomes infected and then a ladybug eats that aphid, well, now that ladybug is infected. And what's even scarier about some of these, especially on a flowering plant, you know, you say you and have. I a, don't know if if uh, infected is the right word, but more the the translocation of the chemical because it's not necessarily a, a disease per se. It's it's a, a chemical exposure. Sure. So the ladybug, gotcha. the ladybug eating the aphid. The aphid has been exposed to the chemical by eating the plant. The ladybug eats the aphid. They've both had the the exposure more so than infection. Yeah. Just to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. And so, you know, same thing with the flowers, like you were saying, you know, you say you have a an ornamental plum tree that maybe you have Japanese beetles and and they've been chewing and uh, skeletizing the leaves on your plant or say a linden tree, um, which Japanese beetles seem to adore. And you treat that tree with a systemic insecticide. Yes, you are going to affect those beetles that are chewing on it but you're also going to affect the bees that are harvesting the nectar from the flower uh, it is now transferred to them and they have done studies showing that you know even several bees that harvest nectar from a tree that has been treated with the metacloprid can take that back with them they have been exposed and they can take that back to the hive and it's it also, can wipe out the hive. Because not only is it in the nectar that they're, the bee is bringing back to the colony, it's also present in the pollen that they're carrying in their pollen sacks on their legs. So it's certainly one of those things that you want to be extremely cautious of how to use a systemic insecticide. And then also just something worth pointing out is that there is no insecticide. There is not an insecticide that is safe to use that beneficial insects are not going to be affected by one of the things that i have spoken to a number of people about is organic insecticides and i i don't know if there is misinformation on the website i haven't seen it but there seems to be a misconception with quite a few people but i talked to several people a year with regards to their assumption that with it being an organic insecticide, that it may be safer for beneficial insects, bees or butterflies, caterpillars, certain caterpillars. And that's not, yeah, that's I, not it at all. I think there's maybe an incorrect assumption being made that, oh, if this is safer for me, then it's safer for the insects that I want to see those beneficials. But right, some, an somehow an targets. It's pretty much non-discriminatory. Right, right. Uh, there's really not a lot out there that that is going to affect aphids chewing on the milkweed, but not the monarch caterpillars and the adult monarch butterflies that are going to the plant. Like it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, think of it as something like a Roundup that you're spraying to kill weeds. Yes, it'll kill the weeds, but if you spray it on the grass in your yard, it's going to kill the grass in your yard too. It's it does not discriminate between one or the other. Yeah, that's that's definitely worth noting. Yes, those organics are going to be safer for humans and safer for you potentially getting exposed to them as you're using them or if you're spraying them around an edible crop, or your veggie or herb garden or whatever, but you also need to be aware of those exposures to the beneficials and kind of take some extra cautions there to not be negatively impacting their populations. And and that can often be some of those chemicals like I believe neem and insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap is probably the one of the more common pyrethrin. ones. Pyrethrin. Or Permethrin as well. Permethrin, I believe, yep. is a synthetic form of pyrethrin, pyrethrin being derived from the chrysanthemum plant. Yes. That group, some of those more common organic options tend to be safer for beneficials if they're on the plant but have already dried. So the pyrethrin... Right. They, they aren't preventatives. They are contact kill only. Right. Um, so they're something not like pyrethrin systemic. pyrethrin has a very short half-life on the plant, especially if exposed to sun. Yeah. Whereas it does not last long on the plant as far as a toxicity level. Right. Um, so, you know, there's no point in broadcast spraying your plant and uh, assuming that it's going to protect your plants is pretty much you 
you see flea beetles on your leaf or you see Japanese beetles on your plant and you spray those directly. And that's a way of kind of controlling your spray and trying to kill only the non-beneficial plants or trying to spray later in the evening, potentially trying to avoid when the, the, the high active period of a bee or a butterfly that might be, you know, around that plant. Right. And, and on like a cool, damp morning, those bees are going to be sluggish and not out and about flying. So yeah, that evening time or early, early, early morning where your target pest might be out and about and active, but your beneficials aren't yet, that would be the window because you have that contact exposure, very different than the systemics that we had talked about. And once that has dried, it poses a much smaller risk to those insects that you want to have around. But can't stress enough, there's once again, there is no insecticide that is not going to have an adverse effect on a pollinator or a beneficial insect. So truly be, if, if you feel the need to use that on your plants, we only ask that you thoroughly read the instructions and apply in accordance to the instructions on that container and to just do, the, you know, all you can do is is your best as far as being conscientious as to when you are spraying, how you are spraying, and what you are spraying as well. So, or over that's all we being, ask. being cautious not to overspray or be spraying on a windy day, a um, hot windy day where it volatizes and spreads all over the place. And if if you're buying a chemical that says you know protects your tree up to twelve months or protects your roses the whole growing season or up to six that's months, that's a systemic and it's going to kill everything that goes into the nectar of that plant. Right. <laughs> There's no soft way of putting it. Yeah. If you use a systemic on your flowering plants, you're killing everything that interacts with that flower. Right. Yeah. I feel Every like insect that interacts with that flower. I think another one I see a lot are the uh, the rose related products that feed and protect or whatever. You know, they have a fertilizer and they they have a, a granular fungicide to keep down leaf spot and also prevent Japanese beetles. And it's like, oh, they're. There's the thing. That's that's the systemic element. So that's just kind of a little taste of information about bees and other information on protecting other pollinators as well and some of those concerns. Again, this is a huge globally significant issue that we've only just barely scraped the surface of. I will link quite a few other articles here from, again, Michigan State, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and some others to give you all on the green team more information. There's some great information, too, from Michigan State on how you can build and manage your own bee hotels for wild bees, sort of similar to what I had described uh, seeing up in the trial gardens up at Michigan State. Lots of really cool stuff there. They're not terribly complicated to make and you can have your own little display, your own little population of beneficial pollinators that will really only help to increase pollination and be beneficial to your gardens, your home, your business, wherever you're at. And with that, we will wrap up our episode on bees and pollinators and some misconceptions about bees. Yeah, I just wanted to also really quick just kind of throw out that, you know, since I'm coming out of the St. Louis area, there are some great St. Louis beekeeper uh, organizations down here where you can get in touch with people and and like-minded people who would like to put forth their own efforts as far as maintaining bees. You can get great supplies. There's a place down here uh, called Isabee's Beekeeping Supplies, and there's another one called Habitat Honey. There's the Eastern Missouri Beekeepers Association. So, so many great organizations and businesses down here in which you can get in touch with people to to help you along your journey or to further your journey and kind of being a steward of the environment in relationship to beneficial bees and pollinators. Yeah. And if you're outside of those areas that we mentioned, just a quick Google search, and I'm sure you will find some sort of bee or pollinator related association that can give you 
more information specific to your area or, you know, say you live in town or in the country alike and need to relocate a hive or something like that, there are always resources out there better than uh, nuking them with a, with a pesticide or something like that. And as far as just a brief little blurb of information and some great pictures, I love my little book here, the National Wildlife Federation Field Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America by Arthur V. Evans. And it is just phenomenal and loaded with just all the information that you could use on a, on a quick passing um, with great pictures to help you better identify bees, wasps, hornets, flies that look like bees, wasps, or hornets so that you can better understand what creatures you have in your own garden space. And another that comes to mind to Garden Insects of North America. Do you have that copy with you? I do have that copy with me. I have it right next to me. Another and book that I really enjoy. You and I have a, we both own a, a copy. love for it simply because of the Cecropia caterpillar that is on the cover of it. But yeah, The Garden Insects of North America by Whitney Cranshaw and David Shetler, The Ultimate Guide to Backyard Bugs. Also a wonderful wealth of knowledge. And, and excellent uh, photography in that book. Oh my gosh, yeah. This book, The Garden Insects of North America, in conjunction with the Field Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America, are pretty much, outside of the internet, my go-to sources for reputable and, and good information on the topic. So with that, we will close out this episode on bees and pollinators Take a look at our Patreon page. Give us a follow, subscribe on there if you can. We are at patreon.com slash take it or leave it. We will have extra episodes and content for subscribers on there every month. Uh, we are also on Instagram and Facebook at take it or leave it pod. YouTube at take it or leave it pod. Take it or leave it pod.com for our website if you have questions or comments or a topic you'd like to see us cover, shoot us an email at show at take it or leave it pod.com. My Instagram is at N Farringdon, N F A R R I N G D O N. And my Instagram is at Hortwise, H O R T W I S E. Thank you all again for listening to this and we'll see you all again next week. Go green team. Goodbye. Yeah.